King Abdulaziz University, oh. either. Ah. And uh, I think he's going to talk about the fecal transplants, maybe. Yeah, sorry. Um, one of my grad students made this shirt for me. Um, <laughs> maybe it should say, ask Marty about fecal transplants, but um, we, can, we can get him one later. Uh, all right, so um, what I want to talk about is really sort of um, building on what um, Marty talked about and talk a little bit more about what I view as some challenges and opportunities in the field of studying uh, microbiomes. And um, you've already sort of heard a little bit about microbiomes, but I just thought I would uh, make, make the point that the field of studying microbiomes in humans and in other organisms has gone a bit crazy. Um, one of the big sort of triggers in this was this study of, from the Gordon Lab of the fact that you could transfer um, obesity from obese mouse to uh, non-obese mice by doing fecal transplants or some transfer of the microbiota. Um, there was this, as you've already heard about, this large human microbiome project. There have been lots of stories uh, going on in the press and other uh, things related to the microbiome, getting lots of popular press. There's lots of sort of what do we do about the microbiome now? How does antibiotics affect it? Um, if you look at the literature, it's gone a bit crazy in PubMed, for example, the number of papers with microbiome or microbiota. And, um, you know, there's lots. It's not just about humans. It's about plants and animals and other organisms. Everything is covered in a cloud of microbes, and we're sort of just um, now really getting the technology. I mean, people have appreciated the importance in some cases, but the technology has changed to allow people to more easily address the biology, the function, the ecology of microbial communities. And in my lab, we've sort of uh, basically moved into becoming a microbiome lab. I used to work on genome sequencing primarily, and now we work on characterizing microbial communities in all sorts of different systems. I'm not going to tell you a lot of detail about each one of these, um, but I'll come back to some of them uh, later. Um, what I want to do is just give a brief, tiny little introduction to the main method that we and many of the other people use in characterizing microbial communities, which is to go to an environmental sample, um, whatever that is, soil, feces, a skin swab, a building, um, take that sample, extract the DNA out of that sample, um, in some cases run PCR reactions to pull out individual genes like ribosome RNA genes, in other cases to do random shotgun sequencing from those environmental samples. You get back the sequence data, and of course, what's changed in this field is that sequencing has gotten um, absurdly easy and cheap relative to what it was previously. And so now we can generate massive amounts of sequence data. We can then compare the sequences to each other and compare sequences across um, different samples. And then, you know, in the dream world, you would end up with an Eric Schatt like plot of the network connections of everything in your ecosystem and every function and every organism and every biological principle um, from that uh, system. But of course, it's not that easy, right? So what I want to talk about is some of the challenges with take, dealing with this you know, amazing data that we're getting. And one of the challenges is just the complexity of the systems that we're trying to study. So you, know, you have one individual human covered in their microbiota. And if you want to characterize their microbiome, one aspect of the complexity is that there are a lot of different kinds of microbes out there. Um, and that, you know, includes bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and viruses, and we don't always characterize all of them, but there's an incredible diversity. In some human ecosystems, there are hundreds to thousands of species present in those systems. Each of those species can have polymorphisms within their genomes. You can have dozens to hundreds of different kinds of each species present in these systems. So the total sum genetic diversity in these systems of the microbes is just astonishing. And we have to deal with that when we're trying to characterize the biology, the ecology, and the functions of these communities. Of course, we don't get out perfect data from these systems, so we're getting lots of data. It's amazing data, but it's fragmented samples of the communities of the organisms that are out there. And of course, on top of all of this, the thing that you know, maybe we're most interested in is the variation in the hosts and whether or not the microbiome is connected to that variation. And so there's lots of different aspects of that 
um, host variation that we could be interested in, whether it's phenotype, but now we also have to deal with many things that we've heard about at this meeting, like the epigenome, the transcriptome, the environment, the copy number variation, all the polymorphisms in the population, and now we want to connect that to health parameters and to the microbiome in these cases. So there's a big data complexity issue associated with characterizing um, these samples. And the other challenge that I want to talk about is very polar sort of opposite of this, which is public understanding of the microbiome and trying to get people to appreciate um, both the importance and the, the, of, of the microbiome and the challenges with studying it. And so you've already heard a little bit about this, but I just thought I'd, I'd bring it to the forefront. There's a massive ongoing um, obsession with killing germs throughout the planet. Um, despite the work of Marty and other people that have shown that antibiotics are a major risk factor for all sorts of problems, we're still pumping antibiotics into all sorts of ecosystems out there on the planet, including human, but also farm animals and a variety of other systems. Um, for example, you may not know, but there are antimicrobials in all sorts of cosmetics and toothpastes. There are antimicrobials on kitchen counters. There are antimicrobials in cars, on walls. Um, all sorts of environments. Now, they're not always strong antibiotics, but they do have effects on the microbial communities. Um, and there's lots and lots of, lots of stuff in the press about germophobia, people wanting to kill all the germs in their environment. And that's generally a bad thing for people to uh, take this approach. At the same time, there's also this sort of rise of what I would call microbiomania, um, <laughs> which is the, the you know, the science has been really interesting on microbiomes, but there's been a little bit of snake oil that has spread into the community about you know, what, how this translates into medical treatments or practices of individuals. And you know, there are probiotics marketed for every possible age group um, in, in every possible health status at various stores. There are pet probiotics. Um, there's a microbiome diet. Um, there's all sorts of articles about how to embrace your microbiome and improve it. Um, there was even this recent article about how you should pick your partner based upon the match of the microbiome during kissing. Uh, no evidence behind this, by the way. Um, and, you know, there's lots and lots of stuff out there. So I, in my blog, frequently give out what I call an overselling the microbiome award. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff out there is probably sort of silly, and some of it is literally dangerous. People proposing that fecal transplants are known to cure schizophrenia, for example, and advertising that in their clinic. Um, I just thought I would point out quickly, um, if you search for some of these terms like microbiomania and uh, germophobia, um, you can find all sorts of old, so there's this, some great 100-year-old stuff on a rise of micro, microbophobia, um, when people showed that you know, bacteria could cause diseases, there were all sorts of people that became obsessed with cleanliness, and there were people criticizing this obsession with cleanliness. So what I want to switch to, so I, we have these, the data is very complex, very interesting, but very complex. Um, and we also have this issue of sort of public awareness. And what I want to go through is just five sort of solutions, five opportunities where I think we can help people out here and people in the community can help contribute to better microbiome science and better sort of the field of microbiomics. One of them I'm going to give you an example of is to just have better reference data. You've already heard when Francis Collins was talking about the Human Microbiome Project a little bit about this. The Human Microbiome Project, one of the things it did was generate complete genome sequences of cultured microbes that came from the human ecosystem. And that serves as reference information when you then sequence from an environmental sample and you want to understand what's in that environmental sample. I've been sort of obsessed about one aspect of this for many years. Um, which is that if we look at the phylogenetic, the evolutionary diversity of genomes that are available, it's very narrow. And so the total sum diversity, the number of lineages of bacteria, for example, are estimated to be on the order of 100, and we basically don't have genomes for most of those lineages. Uh, when I was at Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, many years ago, we got a grant to sort of fill in the tree of life by sequencing one genome from each of eight phyla of bacteria for which there were no genomes available. When I uh, left Tiger and then moved to UC Davis, I worked with the Joint Genome Institute on a project we call the Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, where we marched our way through the tree of life of bacteria and archaea, selected cultured organisms on branches for which there were no genome sequences available, and sequenced those and immediately released the data um, to the community. And we showed in the course of this project that there were many 
ancillary benefits of doing this phylogenetically driven genome sequencing that improved microbiome and metagenomic and other types of microbial diversity analyses across the board, across all samples that you would be interested in. So we convinced many people that this was worth doing. There were spin-off projects, the Genomic Encyclopedia's abbreviated GIBA. There was a cyanobacterial genomic encyclopedia. We did a halo archaeal version, which actually first started with Tim Harkins. I don't know if he's in here or outside, um, uh, with a discussion at a, a pub, um, I believe, to fill in the phylogenetic diversity of one branch of the archaea. And when we've done these projects, um, we think we've done a lot with getting through the diversity of these lineages. But if you actually look at the total evolutionary diversity of bacteria and archaea, the vast majority of that diversity is represented in lineages for which no one has ever cultured any representative in those lineages. And so if we're going to sequence genomes from cultured organisms, we're not going to fill in much of the diversity of life and have reference genomes for those lineages. There are many methods that are, in theory, available for filling in genome sequences from uncultured lineages. The Joint Genome Institute started a project about four or five years ago now called the Dark Matter Project, filling in the genome sequences using whole genome amplification of single cells that have been flow sorted, sequencing those genomes, and then analyzing the data and showing, again, that there were many ancillary benefits that come from filling in the tree of life with uncultured organisms and getting those genomes. We now just got a new NSF grant jointly with um, Ramuna Stepanoskis um, from the Bigelow Lab and Tanya Wojcicki from the JGI to continue to fill in these uncultured lineages. It's a big task. So there are probably 100 phyla, at least, of bacteria and archaea. If we want to fill in half of the total phylogenetic diversity of bacteria and archaea that we know about right now, we probably need 10,000 single-cell genomes. And we have to get each of those from environmental samples. This is a little, our first sampling was at Devil's Hole in Death Valley. But you have to actually go out and get fresh samples for these studies and then flow sort them, identify which ones are novel, and then sequence the genomes. It's going to take a little time, and we need a coordinated effort across lots of different communities to really fill in the tree of life and have genomes from across the tree. Um, but that is possible. Uh, it just needs more coordination. Um, at JGI, we focused on bacteria and archaea. That left out one of the three main branches in the tree of life, the eukaryotes. There are lots of interesting microbial eukaryotes in the human microbiome and in other microbiomes. We need reference genomes for all of those. There are no projects right now that are coordinated phylogenetic sampling across the diversity of eukaryotes or viruses. So we really need better efforts to fill in the tree of life for these different lineages to then be able to interpret random shotgun sequence data from environmental samples. Um, you need to do the same thing, same concept, for protein family diversity. So we've generated massive amounts of genome sequence data from across the tree of life. People have annotated those genomes, in many cases found the actual coding regions, predicted or identified the proteins, but there's not been a very good feedback loop into databases of where are all the new protein families? What is the diversity of protein family life that is out there, which will then feed back into the analyses of all the environmental genomes that are out there? So we need systematic efforts in these areas, and we also need systematic efforts to go out and survey the diversity of life. So we, the Human Microbiome Project started to do that with humans, but we need to do that across lots of other systems. People have heard me talk about this probably before. I want to have a field guide to the microbes like we have for a field guide to the birds. And that could be a field guide within humans or a field guide across all of biogeographical space. So a second area that's in need of development is the methods to analyze the sequence data. There's lots of need for creative bioinformatics people and creative people in various fields of math, ecology, evolution, et cetera, to develop methods to analyze these massive data sets. We've done a little bit of this in my lab. We've developed automated phylogenetic tools that can handle large amounts of data, but there's continuous need of development in these areas to find new protein families, new ways to analyze them, new ways to sort through the environmental data. Another thing that we need is new laboratory methods that can help us sort through and process the data possibly before we get the sequence data or sometimes afterwards. So for example, a graduate student in my lab, Chris Patel, collaborated with Aaron Darling, who used to be, uh, was a postdoc in my lab, on using this method that's been used a lot in studies of eukaryotic organisms where you cross-link the DNA within a cell, this high c 
method, and you can cross-link DNA within a cell and detect DNA that is located physically in the same place within a cell um, as another piece of DNA by then sequencing fragments from these cross-link pieces. You can do the same thing for a metagenomic sample, an environment of communities of microorganisms. You can cross-link the DNA together, and even though you're only sequencing small fragments of DNA, you can figure out which fragment is in the same cell as which other fragment by doing this cross-linking. Another laboratory method that is really um, growing in usage, although it's a little technically hard, is something called nanosims. It's basically um, you take an ion beam and you raster it across your sample in nanometer steps, and you vaporize your sample and then do mass spec of the vapor that's coming off. And you can analyze that to get an idea as to the sub-localization within communities or even within individual cells of particular metabolites, partic particular metals, et cetera, so you can now connect functional information to individual microbes, which we weren't able to do because most of the data that's coming out of these studies are fragmented pieces of data. Um, a graduate student of mine used this method, which was originally developed in Vicki Orphan's lab at Caltech, to study this very unusual microbial community. And we couldn't make any sense out of the community until um, first using nanosims to track the flow of sulfur within the community, and then that still didn't make complete sense out of the community. And so what she did was use some of these new, quote, long read sequencing technologies. One of them, PacBio, is you're generating actual long reads from a community. This other one, which was uh, run by a company called Moleculo, which was bought by Illumina, is basically pseudo long reads from the community. And by getting large fragments from a community where you know that this piece goes with this other piece in the community, it makes it much easier to sort through the data and predict the functions of individual organisms, organisms in a community. And this is really important because a community is not a bag of genes. We can sequence the genes in the community and still not make any sense out of the biology in this community. Community is an ecosystem with interacting organisms and inside the organism, uh, what's there is really important. So um, it's important to have these methods to connect function to taxa. Another thing that we need to do is look at whole ecosystems. As opposed to just looking at the human microbiome, we need to start to better connect the human microbiome to the world that we live in. We've already heard that um, connecting the human microbiome of infants to where they're getting their microbiome when they're colonized is really important. We get it from our mother. We get it from other people. We get it from our food. We get it from our built environment. Um, we get it from our pets. Um, and it's also important to characterize the entire ecosystem in terms of all the taxa. So I realize that this is hard. It's hard to imagine characterizing, for example, all the microbes in this room. But to understand the human microbiome and its effects on health and well-being and disease, we really have to understand the entire ecosystem and not just focus on what's in people itself. I'm just going to skip over that one and go to the last point, which is um, one area that we've moved into in my lab extensively in the last few years has been um, at the interface of public engagement. And it's sort of... Um, inspired for the, some of the same reasons that um, Andrew Sue talked about with his crowdsourcing for medical literature, um, we've gotten really interested in citizen participation in scientific research. And in microbiology, we ran uh, what we think was the first citizen microbiology meeting a few years ago at UC Davis, and then had a follow-up meeting at the American Society for Microbiology. And when we started this a couple years ago, people were sort of saying, well, we're thinking about doing uh, some type of citizen engagement microbiology project. There were a couple of examples of ones that had started, and then all of a sudden uh, it's gone a bit crazy, and there are many examples now of really interesting public citizen uh, engagement microbiology projects. Um, one, I got the slide from Rob Knight a couple of days ago. Uh, the American Gut Project started out as a crowdfunding campaign. They got way more money than they expected. Um, it's to provide people with the opportunity to get their gut microbiome sequenced via, uh, you send in a sample, you get your data back in a little printed out chart, and you can look at how you compare to other people. There's a company that's doing this too called Ubiome. They're sort of both like 23andMe in a way for microbiomes. Um, I, for disclosure, I'm on the scientific advisory board of Ubiome, um, so I thought I would emphasize the American gut here rather than being uh, too biased. But the American gut is an amazing project um, to allow public participation in characterizing your microbiome. Um, we've also sort of thought that maybe not everybody wants to sample their own microbiome. They don't feel comfortable. There are privacy issues and ethical issues. 
So we've been going around at conferences and doing things like having people swab their phones and shoes. Then we sequence the microbes on their phones and shoes and send them back uh, the data. We've done this at a variety of public events. Um, we have a project called Project Mercury where we were doing this at sporting events and all sorts of other events. That's Buzz Aldrin getting his shoe uh, sampled. Um, there's a really great project called the Wildlife of Your Homes Project uh, run by Rob Dunn and Holly Menninger where they've been getting people to sample four sites within their houses and then they sequence those samples and send them back the data. Um, they've sampled about 1,500 homes now and they have really interesting biogeographical data of homes across the globe. We've started a project in my lab that's sort of uh, not quite citizen science, but also more closely tied to educational activities. So we've been working on the microbiome of these interesting marine angiosperms called seagrass. And we've been trying to characterize the diversity of the microbes on these seagrasses. And we have a bunch of people working in the lab doing ribosome RNA-PCR and sequencing and characterizing those seagrasses. And we were struggling with how we were going to collect enough samples to do biogeography of these. And it turns out there's a network of people called the Zoster Environmental Network, labs that collaborate with each other. We sent them kits to sample microbiomes. They went out to the field this summer, um, used a coffee press to sample water, and sampled microbiomes for us, sent uh, the samples back to us at Davis. And we now have a collaborative effort with high schools to do the same thing. Um, and so we think that there are really opportunities for engaging the public in more microbiology Seagrasses aren't warm and fuzzy, so we found a new project that we are launching right now called the Kitty Microbiome Project. Um, there's a Kickstarter campaign about to launch related to this, and you can go to catbiome.com uh, and find out more information about getting people engaged in studying microbiomes by sampling their cats. And I will, uh, in the interest of time, just end it there and leave up my microbial acknowledgement slide here. Um, and thanks for inviting me, and thanks for listening. Uh, do we have one question? All right, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and our last speaker is Stephen Steinhubel from the STSI, and he is the director of digital medicine. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, um, everybody. It's a great pleasure to talk about um, something that I think encompasses all of yesterday's and today's talks in, in a completely different way, and it's focusing on, on um, the a lot of really exciting technology being able to do genetic testing um, at the point of need, and, and how I've kind of subtitled this, moving the mountain of genetic testing out of the lab and right where you, you can use it and the potential that that's going to bring. So I'm just going to um, look a little bit and speculate on some clinical applications, uh, go over a few of the platforms.